We are gathering today to remember the birth of Christ. This is what we do when we are Christians on this Christmas holiday. But we also realize that we are celebrating a cultural holiday as well. Uh, we have, even up here on the platform, Christmas trees. We have lights. We have gifts that we are given, none of which is prescribed or laid out for us in Scripture. Uh, I remember growing up in conservative circles uh, like this, uh, like we, many of you have as well, uh, and we were lectured on why sometimes, even in churches that I'd gone to, why we shouldn't have Christmas trees uh, or why we shouldn't celebrate Santa Claus or different things like this, as was parodied uh, by comedians when I was growing up, you know, that the whole Satan Claus thing and, and, and whatever. I, I don't take some of those strong stands that I grew up with in my childhood. Maybe you could say, obviously. <laughs> um, but we do realize and we do want to distinguish between the Christian celebration of what we remember at the birth of Christ, while we can also acknowledge that there is uh, a holiday uh, that we can also participate in uh, and have great joy. We gather together with family. Uh, some of the reasons that churches even uh, ha here in America have struggled with whether or not there should be a, a church gathering on today. And some churches have uh, had conversations about whether we close on a Sunday or not so because it's time with family. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But the cultural Christmas holiday season teems with many different sights and sounds. Uh, and these are things that have built up over the generations. Some To this day, we may not go a-wassling, burn Yule logs, or roast chestnuts on an open fire. We won't deck the halls with literal boughs of holly, though we might still sing about it. But we do nevertheless have the sense of gingerbread and spices, peppermint, balsam. Familiar songs of the season fill the air to the delight of some and the dismay of others. You've probably seen the meme that the, the lady brings her car into the garage and says, my car is making a horrible noise. And the mechanic replies, well, have you tried taking out the Mariah Carey CD yet? <laughs> what we do with the Christmas story when you have Scrooge being visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, the gets to see all these different things that are going on and his angry, selfish, bitter heart is transformed as what do we see? He is also confronted with the reality that Christmas is a season of generosity. Christmas is intended to be one of giving. And one of the things that stirs his heart to be prompted to that change is when he is looking at the celebration of his employee, Bob Cratchit. And even as they are on the table not having very much, they pray a prayer asking God's blessing. And of course, the famous rejoinder by his son, uh, who is paralyzed and missing a limb, walking on a crutch, he says, God bless us, every one. And the reality of that is that people realize that what they have is a gift from God. And they are and Scrooge is not only to be thankful for what he has, but to be an agent of God's generosity to make others' lives better. And in the process, what we relate to that in the text this morning is that we see that God is blessing all of the nations of the world. If you were only here with us this week, you might wonder why are we going through Acts chapter 8 on Christmas Sunday? Uh, well, part of that is a very practical reason we've been working our way through a series in the book of Acts, and this is where we happen to find ourselves here today. But it is also not without God's design that we find ourselves here on Christmas Sunday, because where this is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, and where we find ourselves here is Philip talking to him about the prophecies of Jesus in Isaiah 53. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did he have to become a human being and die? Why did he have to do those things? Philip gets the opportunity to explain to him the scriptures and in fact, lay out for him the Christmas story. But in also in effect, he gets to help him understand how Jesus didn't just come 
to be born the king of the Jews. He came to give salvation to all of humanity so that God could indeed bless everyone. So let's pick up in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. We'll read down through the end of the chapter. I'm reading this morning from the English Standard Version. Hear the word of God. Luke writes, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I, unless some gun guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does this prophet say about, does this, prophet say this about himself? or about someone else. Then Philip opened his mouth and was beginning with this scripture and beginning with the scripture he told him good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road they came to some water and the eunuch said, "See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized?" And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he, passed through the, as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. If you have a bulletin, I know that some of you didn't get one as they came in, but we did give you the opportunity at the beginning of the service to get one. There is an outline that you can use to follow along uh, as we make our way through the text this morning. The point that we start off with here is that Jesus is bringing blessing. Jesus is bringing blessing. We're trying to build to that ultimate theme. The point that I want you to take away from the text here is that Jesus is blessing the nations. Jesus is bringing hope to all humanity. But Jesus here is singled out as the one who is going to make this man's life better, this one's world better as well. We should start here by thinking through exactly who is Philip engaging with. What is a eunuch? Well, we know, first of all, he is from Ethiopia. That could mean a number of different things. It could mean he's a Jewish man, uh, who has been living in Ethiopia, and he's come back for a religious ceremony or a religious feast or festival. Uh, it would have been a long journey for him to go from Ethiopia to Jerusalem and returning. Uh, commentators say it could have been a journey as long as five months taken on the, the, the kind of mode of transportation that he's going uh, in a chariot, which would not have probably been a military vehicle, but it could have been something like a horse-drawn carriage. It could have been uh, even something like you see carried on people's shoulders where they were walking through the desert. It was not something that they, we would have uh, enjoyed like we have today in our modern transportation kinds of settings, but it is something that he shows that he had a connection to Judaism. He could have been an African man, we don't really know again, but one who had been potentially a proselyte, somebody who had converted from uh, his Gentile religion into at least the Jewish religion. Uh, but it is kind of unlikely that he was at least a full proselyte because he was also a eunuch, which means, I guess we, there's not really any way to get too delicate about it, but he was castrated. He was somebody who didn't have all of his normal physical functions. If you want to look exactly what that means and what that would have had as a religious 
barrier, you can look up in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 1. I'll let you look that up in your Bibles and you'll understand why I won't read that passage out loud this morning. Uh, But it, it tells us, among other things, that somebody who had his condition was not able to enter into the temple, into the assembly of the Lord. There was a restricted access. So he may have bought in to the ideas of Judaism, but he could not have been someone who was given full access into the conversion process. Now, why would he have been a eunuch? Well, there could have been a few different reasons. He could have been someone uh, who was born that way, who had a physical defect of some sort. Seems unlikely because he also had the resources to travel back and forth from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Probably what we would conclude is that he was somebody who was a high-ranking government official. It was not uncommon for somebody uh, to serve in his capacity. Uh, For example, one of the people who would have been a eunuch uh, that we have in the Old Testament was Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem to build uh, the rebuild the wall, and, and Ezra comes later or earlier to build the temple. Uh, those things are going on. Nehemiah, as you recall, was a government official, worked for the king. What was his job? He was the taste tester. Uh, he was one who would screen his food. But he was working in an intimate relationship with the king and with the king's household. This is a pagan setup, so the, the king would have had a harem. And it was, he needed somebody to manage that. And it was not unusual. In fact, it was a regular practice that the king would appoint a servant to do that. And he would make sure that the man was going to be effectively a neutral party. <laughs> and so that's the, the measures that they would take in their society to make sure that the household was managed well. It's something interesting that we should think even with Nehemiah, that God used him in this way to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, but with somebody who wasn't going to technically have access to the temple. And there is something here that is being built on in the theme of Acts, if you've been here in the study. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, you are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Philip has been in the earlier parts of chapter 8 in Samaria, interacting with Samaritans. Ethiopia is considered in the Jewish mindset to be part of the ends of the earth, the full extent of known civilization at that time. And so there's something that we're linking to, but it's also the the reality of being Christ's witnesses, helping bring people to have an audience with God, to give them access to God that they had not previously enjoyed. And there's something that's being developed in that theme as well, as Luke continues to manage his way through this book to record the acts that they are doing, but then also giving us an example, uh, giving us something to think about here, that salvation is not just for the Jews only. They have been given the truth but salvation is for all humanity. It is all mankind. As Philip comes upon him as he is reading the Isaiah scroll, the Holy Spirit is moving in his life. The Spirit, verse 29, says to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And he, Philip hears the eunuch reading the prophet Isaiah. He's reading it out loud. And this would have been for many different reasons, including the the reality of being able to memorize it, to to be able to comprehend it and understand it. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? This is also important for us here today. While we understand the scriptures are sufficient, that give us all of God's truth, the scripture is not always going to be readily and immediately self-interpreting and understood by everyone who reads it. Paul makes this note in 1 Corinthians that we understand spiritual things with the Holy Spirit who illuminates our hearts, that helps us understand. You cannot understand the truth of God without the Holy Spirit of God. 
This is one of the reasons, too, why we come to church. We don't just read Scripture, but this is a central part of what we do when we gather. We have God's Word preached. It is taught. It is explained to us so that we can connect the dots. And that's effectively what Philip does here for the eunuch in this passage. He is reading Isaiah chapter 53. And we've already read the passage, but look at verse 32 again. He says, Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. We can make that connection if you want to go in your Bible and look back at Isaiah chapter 53. You'll see exactly the passage that he's quoting from. As the eunuch is struggling to comprehend, he says, who is this passage talking about? Verse 34, is the prophet saying this about himself or is he saying it about someone else? Probably if he's exposed to any kind of Jewish thought, any Jewish teaching, the options that would have been available to him was Isaiah is talking about Isaiah himself, that this is the suffering servant that he's going through. It could have been a Messiah figure whom they had still not identified in their minds, in their hearts, or it could have even been a collective example of the entire Jewish nation. Uh, and so that could have been one of the things. And, and the eunuch is struggling. Philip takes the opportunity to explain to him by going back to Isaiah, but also talking to him because Philip here has already drawn his conclusion. Who is this talking to? He is a follower of Jesus Christ. He knows that this is a prophecy that has to do with Jesus. This is exactly what Jesus did, by the way, in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. Let's turn there. Luke 24 and look at verses 25 through 27. And I'll read it for you if, you're not, if you don't want to take the time to turn. It says, Jesus said to him, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. He was going back to passages like Isaiah 53 and saying, all these Old Testament prophecies have to do with me. Jesus would say that later uh, in John 17, where he says, search the scriptures, for these are the things that testify of me. You Jewish people think that in the scriptures you have eternal life, but they are the ones that are pointing back to me. You will have eternal life through me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. And Philip explains to the eunuch that this passage is talking about Christ and we have salvation because he has suffered for us, because he has died for us. Jesus dies for our sins. While we don't have recorded in here everything that Philip said to the eunuch, we do know, as we've already made the point, that he's quoting uh, and reading from Isaiah 53. We've read what is verse 7. Luke does not record what is in verse 8 as it continued, but I'll read here for you the context that he would have had as he took the opportunity to explain to the eunuch. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken, and stricken why? For the transgression of my people. Friends, this is technically what we would call Christ's substitutionary atonement. He stood in our place, taking the punishment that we deserved for our sins, and it was laid on him. Paul will talk about this in Romans, where he says that God demonstrates his love for, for, toward us in that while we were still sinners, what did Jesus do? Christ died for us. This is what Isaiah is prophesying. He is standing in our place. He will say this later, earlier in the passage in Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced, and, I believe, and Philip is explained to him, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And through 
Jesus' wounds, he tells the eunuch, you and I are healed. This gives us hope. This gives us salvation. And friend, if you are here today wondering why we are doing more than just Christmas trees, why are we spending so much time talking about the Bible and, and uh, on this holiday season, it is because Jesus has come to give us forgiveness. Jesus has come to give us hope. Jesus has come to give us salvation. And this is important. This is why a day that is so important to the world around us is especially important to Christians. But we also understand that the eunuch, because of his physical condition, was wondering who this person was that Isaiah is talking about. He is now understanding, has had explained to him that Jesus has died for his sins. But we also see in verse 33 of Acts chapter 8, who can describe his generation? This would have been something very important to the eunuch. If you think about his physical condition, he was somebody who was alienated from certainly his own family in the capacity he's probably serving in in his government position. He's ostracized. He can't go to the temple. But then he has no capability of generating a family anymore. He is isolated. He is on the outskirts of his society. This is something that he is going to see as an opportunity for hopelessness, for despair. And Philip is going to be able to capitalize on that and to show him how through Jesus, you have a family relationship. Hebrews talks about this in Hebrews 2.10, for it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus went through what he did so that you, Ethiopian eunuch, could be part of his family. This is what we talked about when we read the scripture passages last night, and the one that we concluded with was John 1. In this portion where John writes, for all who did receive Jesus, who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Paul builds on this theme in Galatians 3.26. It's telling the Galatians, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. And you have that capability to have that relationship with him. When Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you have been justified if you believe in him. When God looks down at you, he no longer sees the sins that separate you and him. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to your account. Does it matter what you do? Well, in one sense, we want to maintain a fellowship with God, and that's something we'll talk about actually here in just a moment, how we demonstrate our faith by our actions. But friends, understand this. What gets you into heaven, what establishes your relationship with God is nothing you can do. It's the hope that Jesus provides for you. When God looks down, he sees the perfection. He sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, and you are clothed in it. And he accepts you because of Jesus, because Jesus stood in your place. You are a son of God. You are a child of God. And even there, we're not being, uh, I hope you understand this too, we're not dismissing the women. Because in this culture, Everybody is a son of God. What happened in that culture of that day? It was the son who had the right to manage the household. It was the son who carried on the family name. It was the son who had the position and the authority. The women, you could say, I suppose in one sense, were the second class. You know, They would take on the, the nature of their husband. They would generate his family line, and so on and so forth. But here, when John chapter 1, our translations, many of our English translations say children of God to try to be accommodating to both genders, but you're really missing something if you don't translate it as sons. Because everyone has that position. Everyone has that standing, regardless of their gender. 
This is what Paul is talking about when he says, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male or female. You are one in Christ Jesus. Everybody has the same kind of access to the Father. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done. And friends, that was very important to the Ethiopian eunuch because in that society, he was on the outskirts. He was ostracized, and Philip is giving him hope that he had never had access to before. And I'm giving you that same kind of hope here because that's the message that Philip had for him, and that's the message that we have for you. Jesus brings blessing, and friend, you can be blessed. And how do we get that? It is by believing in Jesus Christ. We've read that from John chapter 1 and verse 12. All who received him who believed in his name are the ones who are given the right to be called sons of God. What does that look like? Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the message that you need to hear. Maybe that's the message you've heard time before and again. But it is still the simplicity of the gospel message. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that and that alone is all that is necessary for you to call God your Father and for Him to see you as His Son. This is how we have hope because we trust in what Jesus Christ has done. It is also important for us to acknowledge in this passage that how we demonstrate that belief, how we demonstrate that faith, what does the Ethiopian eunuch do? When he puts his faith, when he believes, he says, here is water, what prevents me from being baptized? Baptism fits in the New Testament structure, and it goes very consistently with what James says in James chapter 2. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Well, pastor, wait a minute, you just said there's nothing you can do to enter into heaven. And that's true. It is through belief. It is through putting our faith. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. You are saved by grace through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Amen? That's part, of the, that's part of the message. But our faith, if we are believing, is going to demonstrate it out in what we do. The argument that James lays out in James chapter 2 is Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. But how did he demonstrate he believed God? If you look in James chapter 2, which we won't take the time to read, it's because he sacrificed his son Isaac, or at least he was willing to. God brought him right up to the point where he was going to plunge the knife in his son's heart. And he says, yes, you believe. You've demonstrated that. You are the consistency of your belief. Hebrews 11 talks about that. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And it gives us all these examples. Moses, Abraham, Sarah, all these people that are there. And they are showing their faith by what they have done. And friends, I will remind you, no, not a single one of us is going to be saved by our baptism. But God is calling us to identify with what Jesus has done. And one of the ways that we do that is not by praying a prayer, not by walking an aisle, it is by giving that outward demonstration of what God has done in our hearts through baptism. This is the pattern laid out in the New Testament, Matthew 28. As you make disciples, they are to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, those who receive his word on the day of Pentecost are baptized, and they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. It is something that time and again, when it is mentioned in Scripture, is connected with identifying with Christ. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12. This is the last verse we'll give on baptism. But Paul says that when we are buried with Christ in baptism, and then we are raised with Christ through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. There is a public testimony, a public identification I have believed, and I am telling the world that I am identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then, after Philip baptizes him, he is miraculously taken by the Holy Spirit, verse 39, and the eunuch sees him no more, 
and goes on his way rejoicing. But verse 40, Philip finds himself at Azotus, and as he passed through the towns, he preached the gospel until he came to Caesarea, which reminds us thirdly that the gospel is intended to be broadcast. If we are going to believe, we have to share the truth and the hope of Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Paul says in Romans 10, 17. Even in the times of the earliest persecution of the church, as we've seen in our study in Acts, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, the apostles reply when they are told not to preach Christ any longer. Peter says, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. This is Christmas. John just read to us the Christmas story. We see the shepherds hearing the announcement of the angels. What do they do with it? Luke 2 again, when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. When they had gone to the manger, the way they'd seen the Christ child lying there, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Philip shares with the eunuch the gospel. The eunuch comes to glorious forgiveness and salvation. He enjoys eternal life. He has a sense of hope. He has a sense of belonging that he had never had before. And what we learn is, friends, if you know Jesus Christ, don't lose that hope. Don't lose that opportunity to share that hope with others. Because yes, Jesus has come to bless the world. And it is our privilege and our obligation to share that hope with others. In a day where we see issues like the transgender movement being a really a big source of controversy today, this is something where I believe the Ethiopian eunuch story can make a real difference. There are people who go through these struggles and have this ambiguity, and, and even the way our society treats them, sometimes the way that Christians are stereotypically singled out is casting people who take that kind of a lifestyle choice and putting them aside, marginalizing them, not treating them seriously, not seeing them as real human beings. Eunuchs in the society of what we read here in Acts chapter 8 were treated often the same way. And though they may have had that physical castration process done to them, even here today we have gender reassignment surgeries and people altering their bodies. And sometimes as Christians, we don't really know what to do with that. Jesus gives hope. If the eunuch had kept reading in his Isaiah scroll, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 56. And we'll read verses 4 through 7 as we conclude the message this morning. This man whose body had been mangled and changed and altered, who was cast out of his society, had no access formally to the temple worship, through the prophet Isaiah, he was giving hope. This is what Jesus would come to do. Reading in verse 4, For the Lord says this, For the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold firmly to my covenant, I will give them in my house. So God is saying in the temple, within my walls, a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give each of them an everlasting name that will be never cut off. As for the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to become his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold firmly to my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Salvation, the gospel, 
It's given to the Jews, but it is quickly operating out from the radius of Jerusalem to go to all of the world as the gospel is preached. To anyone who finds themselves, whether it's in an ethnic category, a national category, or even here, a societal category. The gospel is for you. The gospel gives hope. Jesus came to be the Savior of the world, and friend, that includes you. There is nothing you can do to separate yourself from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He has made that available to you. Jesus is blessing the world. As we conclude, one last story. The last time that Christmas fell on a Sunday was 2005. I don't know if any of you remember if there was a a, a source of conflict or division like you've seen unfolding on social media this year. The good news is we don't have to face it again until 2033. So some of you probably won't even be around. I'm not sure if I will. (laughs) But we'll see. But that... In 2005, many churches decided to shutter their doors on Sunday morning so that their ministry staff might spend time with their families. The author of this story says he heard the young wife of a minister at a large church who decided to hold Christmas on our services, and she was lamenting that it wasn't fair for the pastors and staff to have to come to church and miss this precious time with family. She said, no one will be there. The only people who will come are the singles and the old people without families. A single adult who was not involved in a church herself overheard this remark and was shocked. I thought the church was to be the place where those without families could go and find a home, she said later. Isn't the church supposed to be the home for the homeless, the family for the familyless? The church should be a family, especially for those who have none. If we're going to be serious and committed to the gospel, for one, I commend you for being here today. But two, if you've come here today, understand that is the hope of Jesus Christ. He has come to give you a home, to give you a relationship, to give you a family, because he loves us. We need to share that.